Yes, folks, John Fain of Radio 774 ABC Melbourne was at it again defending the indefensible during an interview with Malcolm Fraser, who was Australia's Prime Minister from November 1975 to March 1983. The reason for the interview was to discuss Mr Fraser's new book, Dangerous Allies, in which he points out that it is time for Australia to formulate its own foreign policy and not in future, as Captain Kirk might have put it, to blindly go where its current allies seek to lead it. The elephant in the room wasn't mentioned until about six minutes before the end of the program. Which takes us nicely as we talk about God to the Middle East and uh, Bob Carr has managed to upset a lot of people here in Australia and overseas with his memoir saying that he thought that the uh, pro-Israel in particular Jewish community lobby in Australia wielded too much power. What does Malcolm Fraser think of that? They certainly do. Now, somebody said this a month or two ago and there was a sense of outrage no, we don't have immediate access to the Prime Minister. No, we don't have that. We're just another group. Another lobby group. Uh, well, in relation to the Gillard government, certainly, I'm sure what Bob Carr said was totally and absolutely correct. And uh, other governments? You, are you of that view as well? Um, I once said that ex Israel had exercised excessive power in relation to Lebanon. Um, I got some pretty furious phone calls as a result and people asked to come up to see me and I thought it was going to be two and three and I found, well, there were so many they wouldn't fit in my office. So I said, well, let's go into the cabinet room. They all explained Israel's position, which I understood. And at the end of that discussion, I said, well, gentlemen, I'm glad to have listened to you, but um, you know the Australian government's position. I said that the power Israel used was excessive. That view has not changed, but I've heard you. Thank you. It, it, it's a continuum. It's a continuum. Well, the Jewish community are generous donors to political parties and wield and exercise as much influence as they can muster. Any community does the same. The Italian community, the Muslim community, religious groups, ethnic groups, industry groups. What's the difference? Um, not usually in support of a single country. I don't think the country. Italian community, just to take one example try to get us to follow any particular policies in relation to Italy. And that's the difference. The the Jewish community, or, but not all the community, because I've had many letters, I've got many letters in my office in the files, um, that say, no, we don't agree with the publicly proclaimed leaders of the community in Melbourne. Hmm. We have a, take a different view. and um, But they're not going to say so publicly. Um the Jewish community seek to get Australia to support policies as defined by Israel. Look, Israel, years ago, during one of the wars, killed 30 or 40 Americans on a spy ship in the Western Mediterranean. That was a mistaken missile hit, if I remember correctly, or an airstrike, well, I can't remember. The Americans tried to cover it up. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a mistake, it was deliberate. You believe so? Yes. Based on what? I cannot help but interrupt here. John Fain just used these words. That was a mistaken missile hit, if I remember correctly. If I remember correctly. Well, I would suggest that if John Fain knew to what the former Prime Minister was referring, he must have known that it was far more contentious than a mistaken missile hit. They wanted to be able to do what they wanted to do without America hearing. That's a massive claim to make. So what were they talking about? In the January 16, 2004 edition of Stars and Stripes, the late Admiral Thomas Mora, former commander of the US 7th Fleet, wrote the following. On June 8, 1967, Israel attacked our proud naval ship, the USS Liberty, killing 34 American servicemen and wounding 172. Those men were then betrayed and left to die by our own government. Israeli reconnaissance aircraft closely studied the Liberty during an eight-hour period prior to the attack, one flying within 200 feet of the ship. Weather reports confirm the day was clear with unlimited visibility. The Liberty was a clearly marked American ship in international waters, flying an American flag and carrying large U.S. Navy hull letters and numbers on its bow. 
U.S. military rescue aircraft were recalled not once, but twice, through direct intervention by the Johnson administration. Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara's cancellation of the Navy's attempt to rescue the Liberty, which I confirmed from the commanders of the aircraft carriers America and Saratoga, was the most disgraceful act I witnessed in my entire military career. To add insult to injury, Congress to this day has failed to hold formal hearings on Israel's attack on this American ship. Let's go back a little, and don't forget that this is a former Australian Prime Minister imparting some information that he quite likely obtained from the Australian Secret Intelligence Services. They wanted to be able to do what they wanted to do without America hearing. And John Fain is an obviously pro-Israel radio chat show host who had previously stated... It was a mistaken missile hit, if I remember correctly. Which, to me, smacks of dishonest forgetfulness and he seems to give himself away by the intensity of his response to what Malcolm Fraser said he had learned. They wanted to be able to do what they wanted to do without America hearing. That's a massive claim to make. It borders on the beliefs that some people have, which I've always thought were completely insane, about conspiracy theories like 9-11 and the like. That's what's known as moving the goalposts. John Fain seems to work with a computer in front of him, so he could have done a quick search to see if he remembered correctly about the USS Liberty incident, but he chose to change the subject instead. In fact, I wouldn't put it past him to have been taking lessons in this kind of public dishonesty from Mark Regev, one of Israel's top liars and goalpost-moving experts. Here's Regev talking to Jon Snow of the UK's Channel 4. Mark Regev, um, does Israel accept that it's been using um, phosphorus uh, bombs, flashettes and uh, fragmentation bombs? As your own reporter said, Israel only uses weapons that are acceptable in NATO forces, that are acceptable weapons used by other Western nations, democratic nations. We use no weapons whatsoever that are illegal under international convention or under international law. That speech amounted to a blatant lie. John Snow asked if Israel was, among other weapons, using white phosphorus. But Mark Regev didn't answer that question. And the answer he did give was grossly misleading. No matter in what other circumstances this terrible weapon can be used, white phosphorus is specifically prohibited in air attacks against military forces in civilian areas. And for obvious reasons. But ones that the likes of Mark Regev probably wouldn't be able to grasp because this little fellow is only a Palestinian. And we've previously heard John Fain using a similar technique, not addressing the issue on the table. That's a massive claim to make. But dismissing it by comparing it to another issue, about which he personally feels very strongly. It borders on the beliefs that some people have, which I've always thought were completely insane about conspiracy theories like 9-11 and the like and people believe all sorts of nonsense that they choose to uh, choose to then pursue with no foundation whatsoever I and mean, you can't make that sort of a claim without backing it up can you even if you're Malcolm Fraser and you used to be the Prime Minister. Is this man for real? He's compared the former Prime Minister's opinion about the attack on the USS Liberty to a completely different issue and he certainly did not give his guest a chance to back it up. Perhaps the reason for this was that John Fain had a co-host who decided to make a contribution at this point. It was irrelevant, but it deprived Mr. Fraser of the opportunity to counter this outrageous assertion. You can't make that sort of a claim without backing it up, can you? Even if you're Malcolm Fraser and you used to be the Prime Minister. Apart from his own unbacked up assertions that serious doubts about the official 9-11 narrative had no foundation whatsoever, Fain had already indicated his uncertainty about the USS Liberty incident. It was a mistaken missile hit, if I remember correctly. So he had no business dismissing out of hand the statement that his distinguished visitor had just made without making any effort whatsoever to check to see that, just maybe, he himself, the inimitable John Fain, may have remembered incorrectly. I have made two previous videos featuring John Fain's overbearingly rude attitude to another one of his guests, Kevin Bracken. At the time, Victorian branch secretary of the Maritime Union and the president of the Victorian Trades Hall Council. 
admittedly not a former Prime Minister, but a worthy voice of the people nonetheless. There are links to these videos in the notes, but here's an excerpt from Friends of Israel, Enemies Inside the Gates. Josh Frydenberg, Australia's first ever Jewish Liberal Member of Parliament, had this to say. I refer to the comments of Kevin Bracken, President of the Victorian Trades Hall Council and, Mel and member of the Port Melbourne branch of the Labor Party, that, in relation to the terrorist attacks on the World Trade Centre on September the 11th, 2001, and I quote, I believe the official story is a conspiracy theory that doesn't stand up to scientific scrutiny. If the Prime Minister finds these comments as offensive as most right-thinking Australians, what action will the Prime Minister take to discipline Mr Bracken and send a message to others that such remarks are unacceptable? They may have been unacceptable to him, but three-quarters of the Australians who responded to a poll following the broadcast found Kevin Bracken's statement reasonable. But of course, they may not have been right-thinking Australians, that is, Australians who think the same way as Josh Frydenberg and John Fain. For it was John Fain who started this particular censorship ball rolling. Which version of the conspiracy theories do you subscribe to for the alternative? Well, I, I Are you saying that the Israelis engineered it, or do you believe that there's the Bilderberg group, or which version of the nutter conspiracies is, is the one you subscribe to? It is clear that John Fain is well aware of the widespread suspicions about Israel's involvement in 9-11, and this typical excerpt from his vitriolic attack on Kevin Bracken demonstrates that he is determined that a new investigation should not be launched. I'm the president of the Victorian Trades Hall Council and we've taken resolutions from both I think those. it reflects very poorly on your members, Kevin, that you have views that are so ridiculous, so extreme and so unacceptable because this is the lunatic fringe, this is the extreme right... And on and on he went and his views seem to be shared by Australia's Prime Minister. Obviously, I don't agree with the remarks. Obviously, they are stupid and wrong. Of course, the Prime Minister's response was beside the point. The point being, what was Australia's first ever Jewish Liberal Member of Parliament doing asking a Prime Minister to discipline someone for holding views that are contrary to his own and John Fain's? Shades of things to come, perhaps? Here are two more clips from that video. Obviously, I don't agree with the remarks. Obviously, they are stupid and wrong. Uh, I think the member was in the House yesterday when I gave my Prime Minister's statement on Afghanistan. I would refer him to that. Uh, that is my view, obviously. And on and on she went, which pleased the Honourable Member for Kuyong, the Friends of Israel and Tel Aviv, no doubt. But how many right-thinking Australians will it please? Certainly not those who noticed that she gave no reasons for calling Kevin Bracken's opinions stupid and wrong. She just echoed John Fain's dismissal of them, only a matter of hours after they were first broadcast. But had she asked, her staff may have discovered that NIST has been suppressing a video during which an explosion can be clearly heard just before WTC7 collapses into its own footprint. Listen carefully. Obviously, a video crew were waiting for something to happen and can be heard chatting, which is why they didn't seem to react to the low-frequency explosion. Then one of them does react as the building begins to fall. By suppressing the higher frequencies in the soundtrack, the explosion becomes clearer, and you can see that nothing has been added. The shaded area of the waveform is what has been subtracted. Now, even Prime Ministers, Members of Parliament and radio chat show hosts should be able to see that this was, indeed, a controlled demolition, pre-rigged weeks before 9-11. To fit into the hijacked plane's knockdown huge buildings legend, WTC-7 must have been the intended target of the plane which was almost certainly shot down by a military pilot who ignored the NORAD stand-down. Or the people who attacked the United States in New York shot down the plane over Pennsylvania and attacked the Pentagon. Of course, the official story does not include terrorists shooting down a plane. They were supposed to be inside them.
The so-called five dancing Israelis, arrested on 9/11, having been seen dancing, laughing, and high-fiving as the towers collapsed, provide yet more evidence that there was pre-knowledge of the attacks. And at that point, we were taken for another round of questioning. This time, related to our allegedly being members of Mossad. The fact of the matter is, we are coming from a country that experiences terror daily. Our purpose was to document the event. Our purpose was to document the event. To document the event. The event. The five Israelis were detained for ten weeks and finally deported on immigration violations after the FBI cleared them of any involvement in 9/11. Listen again to the tone of that government handout, mainstream media lackey. After the FBI cleared them of any involvement in 9/11. No wonder Mr. Wolfowitz looked so pleased because the dancing Israelis did not need to be mentioned in the report, and the collapse of WTC7 wasn't mentioned either. The NTSB didn't bother to forensically identify the aircraft remains, and the serial numbers of their flight data recorders are still being withheld. As for the missing Pentagon surveillance videos, they are still missing. Other glaring omissions relate to the information which could have been obtained from some of the 50 or so videos of the plane which hit the South Tower. But thanks to an independent Canadian researcher, Jeff Hill, we know how Park Foreman got his famous shot. I was standing on top of a、uh, brownstone in Brooklyn Heights. My neighbor was standing right next to me, and we were just watching. And、uh, I'm looking through the camera lens, and he says,、uh, "What the f- is that?" And I pan the camera to the left and picked up that plane. Few researchers think that this plane was United Airlines Flight 175, and this engine has never been forensically identified. The planes were murder weapons, but along with many other important pieces of evidence. It was dumped in a landfill on Staten Island, and it is a travesty that this video was not examined and these vital questions asked: Who shot the video? How did it get to WABC New York or CBS? But most intriguingly, how did the person who shot it know where to point the camera? Several groups of men were seen setting up cameras across the Hudson before the planes hit the towers. Witnesses reported they saw some men jumping for joy in Liberty State Park after the North Tower impact. But one camera crew were less public about it, for they seemed to have found a very discreet camera position in order to document the event with an excellent landmark to help with plane spotting. Unlike the park foreman shot, this looks like. Waiting for the event to happen, without the landmark, the operator has nothing to line up on, so the camera's direction could be way off. The plane pulled out of its dive above the Statue of Liberty, and having the camera pointing over Ellis Island was the ideal place to pick it up and follow it on the last eight thousand feet of its murderous journey. Using Google Street View, I was able to identify the camera position. The wall in the foreground of the video is this wall, and the camera operator stood on this surface—a flat, sloping roof. There doesn't appear to be any easy access, only trapdoors or skylights. So it looks as though it was chosen because it was the right place to get the shot, not because it was casually convenient. It is now widely accepted that even experienced pilots would have had difficulty hitting the towers with such accuracy, and that the planes were almost certainly remotely directed under computer control. So the plane's flight path would have been known to those who were there to document the event. So here are some questions for John Fain's publicly funded supervisors. One. Given that John Fain would almost certainly have seen this video, how could he make the following statement to anyone, let alone a former prime minister, three years and six months later? Conspiracy theories like 9/11 and the like, with no foundation whatsoever. With no foundation whatsoever. From my reading of the ABC's key editorial standards, John Fain has breached them many times over. He is clearly a gatekeeper for Israel and should have no place in front of a publicly funded microphone, twisting the facts to suit the agenda of a foreign nation. So, what is the ABC going to do about him? While you're thinking about that, here's a taste of what could happen in Australia if John Fain and others like him have their way. 
To understand the consequences of this craven groveling, hearken not unto Netanyahu's words, rather look upon some of his nation's recent deeds and juxtapose them with the almost unanimous approval of the United States Congress. Zaitun, flattened by Israeli bulldozers. But in this house, they'd herded 100 members of the Samuni clan. And then they shelled it, killing 49 of them. Gaza, white phosphorus, dropped on a civilian population causing death, blindness and other horrendous injuries. May 2010, murder in the Mediterranean. The attack on the Freedom Flotilla attempting to break the illegal siege of Gaza. Out of a multitude of nationalities on board the Mavi Marmara, nine men, all Turkish, were gunned down in what must have been targeted assassinations. 19-year-old Furkan Dogan, an American citizen of Turkish descent, was shot once in the chest and four times in the head. I intend to cite this video as evidence in a complaint I am about to make to the Australian Broadcasting Corporation and I hope that you will do the same. The link to this form is in the video notes. All you need to decide is whether you want to be ruled from Canberra or from Tel Aviv.